very much, Ewan, and I appreciate you bumping me up on the schedule. Wally, can I acknowledge your soon-to-be-delivered welcome to country? Can I acknowledge the very real importance of every Minister for Health addressing closing the gap in Indigenous life expectancy and the circumstances of our first Australians? And can I recognise that their health is deeply linked to their connection to their country? It's terrific to be here with my friend and colleague, Dr. David Gillespie, who I know has spoken to you this morning and who has the very important uh, portfolio of workforce within his area of responsibilities. Uh, with Ken Wyatt, the three of us, Ken is uh, uh, doing very great work in aged care, which also comes under the health portfolio, and um, other aspects of health as well. So it's fabulous to be here, and I acknowledge Tony Zapier from the opposition. And the three of us will uh, get up and run out of the room very quickly, because Parliament bells ring at 9.30, and we don't want to be the three people who didn't make it to that very first division. And being a Thursday, we're pretty certain that it'll happen fairly soon. Tony might know, but uh, he wouldn't tell me if he did. <laughs> um, can I... Uh, thank the Rural Doctors Association of Australia and the College of Rural and Remote Medicine, ACRAM, um, for your contribution to the field of rural medicine and the health of all Australians. Lucy, uh, you have always been uh, a terrific uh, advocate for your people, uh, but more importantly, you've been a pleasure to deal with. You've always come into my office with a big smile on your face, even when the subject matter is pretty challenging and you've always looked on the bright side. Uh, Ewan, it's been terrific to have your input into important areas of this portfolio, rural health policy, uh, and everyone else that uh, has put this conference here today. Uh, rural health is a fundamental priority for the Australian government and for me as Minister for Health, from my huge electorate of Farrah that runs all the way along the Murray River to the South Australian border, and takes in farming and agricultural communities in the Murray and Riverina and beyond, I do know the great challenges and rewards of rural life, including rural health delivery. In fact, if I go back to 2001, the year I entered Parliament, and I never imagined I'd be here this long, but of course time has flown. Um, in order to understand the community that I sought to represent, I hooked up um, an old 1974 Millard caravan that was in the shearing shed on the farm that I'd lived in for three years as a shearer's cook um, and, and, and worked in Western Queensland and uh, remote South Australia. I hooked up the caravan, I painted it blue, I put Liberal Party logos on it, as you do, and um, I drove up and down the Murray and I didn't do much talking, which for politicians is perhaps surprising, but I did a lot of listening. And I still remember so many of the conversations I had in those early days were focused on health. Uh, the health challenges, the health needs and the health gaps. And that's really, really stayed in my mind. So long before I became health minister, I, um, and even as local member, when I take off my health minister hat and sit in my offices in either Albury or Griffith these days, um, so many of the the people that walk through the door talk to me about health, even if it's not the main thing they've come to see me about. Um, they will always have something to say. Because my constituents and your constituents live and breathe it. We've been dealing with this rain and floods, and yesterday I had the tiny school of Hilston um, in the parliament, and some of the children said, well, when we go back home, we won't be going home because the floods have already cut off all our farms. But they were quite, you know, um, resilient and resolute in their appreciation of the circumstances they were facing and they were just more interested in Parliament House. And to me, those children um, epitomise what, what rural communities are and, and what they become. Um, so my commitment to the work you do is, is personal and uh, I, I ask the question, what is it about rural health that draws us all in? I think it is the challenge and the reward. Rural health offers more of both to everyone involved to the policy makers, to the people in rural communities, to the huge diversity of different health professionals, researchers, teachers, practitioners and health delivery services who contribute to the rural health arena. The greater the challenge, the greater the reward. And it is this particular environment, and especially in Australia where we have such vast distances, such complex and diverse communities, that I also see great opportunity. Opportunity for innovation, for resourcefulness, for courage and for collaboration. Opportunities to develop world's best practice healthcare in these difficult and sometimes contentious environments. 
opportunities to be the best in the world. And for me, it's obvious that this environment both attracts and creates a particular kind of outlook, a level of skill and a certain calibre of person that really does represent the cream of the crop. That also means we have some of the best, the most innovative, resilient and committed people working in the field of rural medicine, including all of you. So it's my job to create and maintain the environment for all of you to do what you do so well. This is a partnership and it always will be. A collaboration to ensure that together we bring the best ideas and people to delivering healthcare to rural and remote Australian communities. Our broad agenda is a stronger, more sustainable, more streamlined, more patient-focused health system that upholds the principles of universal healthcare, invests in Medicare, and prepares the system for the future. I do want to emphasise patient focus because with all of the range of issues that um, come across my desk and we've been talking about the prosthesis listing advisory committee and how we reduce the, the cost of medical devices in the private hospital system, you, you know, everything in health you'll have um, a group representing different parts of the system sitting around the table. But if you look at it, as I always say, from the perspective of the patient, uh, you, you get the best answer. You don't always know, you don't always get how to get there, but you really get the integrity of the decision making by making those decisions patient focused. As you know, our primary health networks have been up and running for 12 months. This organisational model puts control of healthcare into the hands of regions and communities themselves. The networks commission services in those communities. Now, primary health networks are still relatively new and still perhaps not as well understood as they could be. And wherever I go in Australia, I make sure I talk to the primary health network and find out what's going on and reinforce the messages of government, and I do this in the communities and with clinicians as well, that we see the primary health networks not as obviously their predecessors who were called Medicare locals or their previous predecessors who were divisions of general practice, although they're more closely aligned with that model because they don't deliver any services and they are not experts in clinical uh, in, the, in, in, the, in the clinical nature of any services that happen in their region. What they are is like an invisible skin between the Commonwealth dollar and the services on the ground. And their role is to make the best use and get the best value for every single one of those Commonwealth dollars. Because, yeah, the health portfolio is about $79 billion, or it will be at the end of this forward estimates, um, and there's no more money coming in from anywhere else and we don't need a lecture, you don't need a lecture from me to explain the fiscal circumstances that have created this situation. But it is very much the case that we have to make every dollar deliver the best possible value. And our agents in, on the ground uh, to make that happen are the primary health networks. But what they do must be informed every step of the way by community and clinical advisory groups. So I'm watching that closely and always very keen to have your feedback if you feel in the particular area that you're working that isn't happening as well as it should be. Because we are just starting out and you know there are opportunities with every new model to tweak it. But that's the key thing. Informed on the ground by local people and the local needs, not delivered as a one-size-fits-all package from Canberra. Um, Different primary health networks are focusing on different things. Some of you may be aware that we have, or during the campaign, we announced uh, a, a funding for uh, suicide prevention trial sites, one of which is in the Kimberley, and Ken Wyatt and I were there last Friday. And we talked with the primary health network at the table about the needs of that community and how we might deliver a suicide prevention trial that did so much more, that, has, that does so much more uh, than what so we, we've seen in the past. And we came away with some really strong messages and we had a blueprint for action and we have some key things that we want to do, one of which is to develop the workforce in the Aboriginal medical services to a level where the cultural competency that people are treated with is absolutely first class. And I was really struck by one local woman who said, you know, you've all flown in here. You're all service providers. Uh, you all fly out again. Um, and we're still here. 
So what about the unsung heroes at the coalface? What about the unsung heroes who do what they do every day in a community who don't get any recognition, who may not get any money, uh, but know what needs to be done at the family and community level? And that struck me very strongly and the next meeting we have will not be with the necessarily too many service providers but with those unsung heroes who are, as this woman said, working every day and actually do know what's needed, then it becomes the responsibility of governments through the primary health networks to design the policy response, to look at what somebody on the ground at the grassroots level is saying. Now, we can't expect that person to be able to describe a policy intervention that starts up here with however many million dollars it is, but that's our job. Our job is to translate that into something that works in the real world. Similarly, we announced um, the same in, in Townsville and the Primary Health Network will be featuring there for a, uh, and that, that relates to mental health for our veteran community. And the findings will spread across the whole of Australia. One of the key advantages I see in the PHNs is that they link with a local health network. We're never going to get this right unless we have the joined up nature between the state hospital system, public hospital system and primary care. And by overlapping in the regions, the PHNs and the LHNs uh, actually do get the opportunity to do that. And I've been really encouraged by two state governments at least who are funding the PHNs maybe not directly, but indirectly, so they're recognising that this is where you bring together um, the right level of patient care across the patient journey. Uh, I do look forward to working with you, for us all working together on broader structural reform issues, because rural health delivery is complex, particularly in the Australian context, and it's multifaceted. But if I was to summarise our focus right now, I think we've got three key issues three areas where we're taking action and making big changes to improve outcomes and increase the focus and the resourcing in a nutshell. Workforce, infrastructure and communities having control over the kinds of services they know work best for them. And in these crucial areas, I believe we're showing our commitment through action. I've talked about the primary health networks and their absolute requirement to have the community focus. In terms of workforce challenges, overarching all the work we're doing, and I know you've spoken about this this morning, is the National Rural Health Commissioner. And I know that David has been and will continue to have discussions about what the rural, National Rural Health Commissioner can do, uh, other than what we've talked about more generally, which is define the rural generalist pathway, uh, however it may look in the different states of Australia. Again, not one size fits all coming from Canberra, because state governments invest differently in their own rural training pathways in different ways. Some, I'm sure, do it better than others, and we need them as, a sta as state governments absolutely at the table with us, because without the right training and supervising positions in the rural hospitals, we aren't going to have the movement of candidates, whether they be junior doctors or practising later in their life, out to rural and regional Australia. Part of the Commissioner's role will be to develop options for increased access to training. Training and, of course, appropriate remuneration for rural generalists, because extra skills and hours uh, deserve those things and bring about the greater incentives to practise in the bush, even though, as Ewan said, it isn't necessarily about the money, but when you've got such disparity in wages between the city and the country, I think that has to be addressed. Um, the, the Rural Commissioner will build on other general practice training programs that support those advanced skills in the existing general practice workforce to ensure we have a pipeline available to provide an ongoing and sustainable supply. Our integrated rural training pipeline is a, a real commitment of $93.8 million over four years. The uh, rural Health Multidisciplinary Training Program that many of you had input into as we made some changes to it about a year ago is $131 million over four years. We've sharpened the focus of General Practice Rural Incentives Program to ensure that support goes to those areas most in need. And we've allocated $40 million over four years to create more intern training opportunities in private hospitals in rural and regional areas. 
and 238 million over five years to double the practice incentives program, teaching payments for teaching in general practices, with a loading of up to 50% for practices in rural and re remote locations. Now, I quickly mention all the dollars, just so you get the general impression that we are investing and we are going to continue to invest. And while the dollars aren't easy to find, uh, we know the value that they add in this important area. As I've mentioned, the unique environment of rural medicine leads to remarkable innovations and ways of tackling problems that are simple but very effective. These innovations, your insights and experiences can help reform practices across the health system as a whole and provide us with information and learnings that improve the way we deliver care in so many ways. And that is the, 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 the beauty of rural practice. It's different but it works and it's devised, designed and operated by the people who know it and are closest to the system that they're delivering and the patients that they treat. Before I wrap up, I want to quickly mention healthcare homes because in primary care, in general practice, it's the key component of our reforms. And it is going to be a whole new way of government remunerating doctors, of doctors looking after people with chronic and complex conditions, and the health system as a whole moving to an outcomes focus. Now, no one's going to have to sign up to it. As I often say, we're not the National Health Service. We're never going to employ doctors, and we're never going to make them do something. We love and respect the model of practice we have in Australia. Uh, you know, I acknowledge the challenges, and you've mentioned the pause in payments for general practice, and I acknowledge the challenges of those. But we stand behind a, the business model that you are all in, uh, or most of you are, and we recognise that it makes sense in Australia, and it's quite uh, separate from many other similar models in the world. The healthcare homes at the moment are rolling out in a trial sense, so 65,000 patients in about 200 general practices are being enrolled for the trial to test this model. And as I said, it's quarterly bundled payments to doctors to allow them to provide the care that they want to, that they know the patient needs, without being restricted by the very transactional basis of Medicare um, and also the hours of operation. I talk to doctors who say, uh, you know, I'd, I'd like to, many of them do these things anyway, of course, without being paid, you know, I'd like to be in touch via text message with, for example, a young newly diagnosed type 1 diabetic, um, just so they can send me their blood sugar levels late at night or if they're suddenly very anxious about something or they've just got um, a, a new pump and they don't know how to use it, uh, I want to be in touch with them then. I don't want them to have to ring someone else in a public hospital system. I, don't want, I, I want them to be in touch with me. The model is about empowering patients to connect better. Uh, and let's acknowledge it, that people are drifting away and often seeing many different doctors or but connecting better with the usual doctor, with the usual practice who understands them. And key to this is empowering the patient because as you know, if they don't do the things they need to when they've been diagnosed with a chronic condition, uh, you can't do everything and you can't force them either. So um, the healthcare homes model uh, is being, we've got an implementation group. They're working through further details of what this will look like. And as I said, it will be trialled in a number of practices. And people say to me, but what about the money? And I say, we're getting the design right. Uh, the money will follow. That'll be uh, our job as government. And if we want this to work, we will have to get the money right. Because otherwise, as medical practices, you'll say to me as health minister, thanks but no thanks. So it really is an example of the partnership that we want to have with you in designing something that you know works. And there are so many opportunities inside that uh, for you to deliver the kind of care with the partners that you see on the ground, whether they be allied health professionals, um, mental health nurses, primary care nurses, in aged care facilities, to deliver that in the way that you actually want to. Again, not one size fits all from Canberra. In the little country hospitals that are the heartbeat of small towns, doctors, nurses, aged care workers working in isolation in small teams save lives every day of the year. GPs getting up in the middle of the night to treat a friend or neighbour who may have had a farming accident, a heart attack, a sick child, asthma or depression. Specialists who travel to the regions to check on their patients with melanomas, with complications from strokes, diabetes and all the other conditions. Mental health workers, social workers, counsellors, providing care and support and solace during the long droughts, the floods, giving of themselves 
to prevent suicide, to tackle drug and alcohol problems, giving their all. This is all of you. This is the intensity, the intimacy, and the great privilege of rural medicine, to be let into the lives of often fiercely independent private people, to be part of the community, respected, loved, and needed, to operate in the most trying of circumstances, to feel the deep satisfaction of work that is meaningful and makes a difference. It is indeed an honour to work with all of you to improve rural medicine. Thank you. <laughs>